too. Okay. So we're supposed to do it here or something, or else yeah. yeah, I don't know what the way the camera is, but um, it's my right. uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Barbara Clark, my colleague. Uh, Dr. Clark is an associate professor of biochemistry and molecular genetics here at U of L, right our her lab, and officer are right upstairs here. Uh, Dr. Clark received her undergraduate education at Miami University in Ohio and her PhD from UT Southwestern. She then did a postdoctoral fellowship with Doug Stocko at uh, uh, Texas Tech in, in Lubbock and stayed down there in Texas for a while um, before being recruited to UofL in 1995. So this is actually Barbara's 25th year here at, at UofL and she has a chair coming which I look forward to seeing someday. Um, Dr. Clark's expertise is in uh, steroidogenic acute regulatory pro protein, STAR, which she cloned back when she was at Texas Tech. And she's interested in regulation of gene expression and signaling by members of the nuclear receptor superfamily. Dr. Clark has published over 60 peer-reviewed papers and um, is an accomplished uh, for a teacher of medical and graduate students, as well as being past director of the graduate education program in biochemistry and molecular genetics. In addition to her uh, research and teaching activities, Dr. Clark is now the acting associate dean of the graduate school. So she spends about half her time on the Belknap campus and, and half her time here. And today she's going to share some of her latest research and her knockout mouse um, with us. So we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Carrie. It uh, doesn't seem, 25 years goes quickly. <laughs> you don't think that, but it does. So, uh, Well, I'm glad to be here today. It's been a few years since I've talked to this group, and I know there's a lot of new faces. So um, as said in the introduction, I'm going to be talking about generation of the knockout mouse of STAR D5 and looking at a potential role of this lipid transporter in nuclear receptor signaling. And this will be in the context of diseases of uh, diet-induced obesity, mainly as one uh, disorder, that, uh, and diabetic nephropathy are two of the disease states that I have been uh, studying. So I came with the assumption that probably very few know anything of what STAR D5 stands for, that family of proteins. And uh, this talk will then, oh, there we go. Oh, before I go on, I have nothing to disclose. So this talk will then start with uh, introducing you to the START domain protein family. And we'll review quickly the nuclear receptor signaling and the role that plays in uh, lipid metabolism as well as bile acid uh, regulation. So that would be by oxysterol regulation of the LXR receptor and bile acid regulation of FXR. And then to share with you the uh, what I'm looking at really to see if there's a link between the function of STAR-D5, which we really know very little about, and LXR and FX signaling. And to address this question that I have, uh, we've generated star 5 knockout mice. So what is uh, the START domain protein family, or what, where star 5 belongs to, I should say, the START domain protein family? So what is this protein family? Well, shown here is the structure of the START domain, and you see this and what is depicted here is this is a basically a, approximately a 200 amino acid domain that has folded in this structure. Shown here would be a long hydrophobic tunnel, and this is where hydrophobic lipids bind. And members of this uh, protein family bind sterols, phospholipids, and fatty acids. So they're really lipid transport proteins. And the this domain is named after the STAR-related lipid transfer domain, or START, and that comes from the steroidogenic acute regulatory protein STAR, which I was fortunate enough to be able to name this protein STAR when we uh, cloned it and found its function in terms of transporting cholesterol into mitochondria for the first step in steroid hormone biosynthesis. 
And so using the structure of the STAR uh, protein doing da database alignments, there's a group that found that this domain and basically is highly conserved and found in multiple lipid binding proteins uh, across all phyla. And what we will focus on really is the mammalian members of this protein family, of which there are 15. And this uh, figure here is just to give you a quick viewpoint of the different uh, subfamilies within the mammalian start domain family. And they are separated based on the type of sterile that they bind or lipid that they bind and some other uh, factors. So you have uh, STAR, uh, the STAR-D1 subfamily. In this case, they have signal sequences that can locate these pro proteins to specific organelles, such as the mitochondria for STAR-D1 and the lysosomes for STAR-D3. This is uh, STAR-D3, uh, maybe of interest is moves cholesterol between the endosome and lysosome has been implicated in Neiman pick like disease disorders. The soluble sterile transporters, in which will be the focus of today's talk, basically have only that start domain. There's no information in the primary sequence of the protein to direct it to any particular membrane. So a big question remaining in the field is what is the directionality of a sterile transport within the cell? The uh, phospholipid binding protein family, as uh, shown here, binds, uh, has been identified to bind a phosphatidylcholine mainly, and it can be uh, localized to certain membranes. Here we see that this one uh, particular family member, STAR-D2, has been uh, gaining a lot of interest in terms of uh, insulin resistance that may be playing a role in that uh, or contributing to that disorder. This is a ceramide transport protein that moves ceramide between the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi, and again has uh, signals within this protein that directs it to those organelles. Now, there's a whole class of uh, start domain containing proteins that have other functional domains linked to them. And in this group of proteins, this is deleted in liver cancer or DLC start proteins. They are known uh, to function as tumor suppressors. So if there's mutations in this group of family of proteins, then there you see uh, increased proliferation in some cancer cell types. There is a uh, multi-domain protein family that has activities associated with, with the thioesterase family. And, um, and again, these are uh, gaining more attention into their function in terms of, I would say, just here with the uh, thermogenesis and browning of the adipose tissue. So what is Interesting, I think some of the functions are being better described for these multi-domain proteins where we don't really know the ligand that binds into that start domain part of that, and we don't know the function of the start domains in this multi-domain protein. And in this group of proteins, uh, start uh, family members, we know the ligand that binds, and in some cases we know the function very well as, term, as example, ceramide transport. But again, for the soluble transport family, the function is not well established. And so I became interested in uh, STAR-D5, looking at its uh, uh, function or trying to gain some insight into its function. And this, as stated, the uh, challenge with these soluble transport proteins, which is cartooned here, you just have the start domain and the proposal is it will be moving cholesterol from one membrane to another membrane. So ER, the endoplasmic reticulum is depicted here is really uh, cholesterol poor, and cholesterol can move to the plasma membrane. And there's vesicular, non-vesicular transport of cholesterol, and this, uh, the start proteins play a role in non-vesicular transport. 
Uh, Stardy 4 is another member of the subfamily just for completeness. That it's some of the functions we know that can enhance cholesterol ester uh, formation due to activation of the acyl cholesterol acyl transferase protein, and so it can help form lipid droplets within the cell. So with this model, we know that these start proteins of function is proposed to be that it absorbs cholesterol from one membrane, moves it to a second membrane, and deposits that cholesterol. But again, without knowing the directionality, it could be dependent upon the cholesterol content in the membranes to how these are moving. So a lot of in vitro work has been done to try to identify the role of the start v 4 and star d 5 proteins in moving cholesterol within the cell. And again, looking at star d 5 just from, from the first studies, what uh, was known is that doing ligand binding assays, both direct and indirect type of assays, it's found it can bind both cholesterol and 25 hydroxy cholesterol. Now, linking this to the second or the middle part of the talk, that 25 hydroxy cholesterol is a ligand for the nuclear receptor LXR. So, where STAR-D5 is expressed was uh, highly expressed in macrophages. The first uh, Detection of star D5 in the liver, they uh, said it was predominantly expressed in the Kupfer cells of the liver, but now we know that it's expressed in both hepatocytes and Kupfer cells, and in kidney. So there was a group that has been working on um, star D5 expression in the liver and macrophages. So some of the early work showed high expression in kidney, and that gave my interest to start looking at potential role of STAR-D5 in the kidney. We also know that STAR-D5 mRNA expression is, a, is increased by agents that promote ER stress. And so this is endoplasmic reticulum stress, and we know that ER stress is associated with a lot of disease states, such as uh, diet-induced obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and uh, diabetes. So this link between, you know, certainly cholesterol, cholesterol metabolism, and these disease states uh, gained my interest in looking at the role of this transporter potentially in those uh, disorders. So a lot of the first work was set up with the assumption and that STAR-D5 is moving cholesterol and hydroxylate cholesterol uh, in the cell. And then there came a report that there is star D5 does not bind cholesterol, but in fact binds bile acids, and chinodeoxycholic acid being one of the major binders. Now, I will say um, this group out of uh, Canada, which showed that uh, through NMR, direct binding assays, also that it bound, that star D5 bound bile acids, they could not show that this uh, lipid transporter could bind cholesterol. That is in direct contrast with the original group that reported that this uh, STAR-D5 could bind cholesterol and 25-hydroxy cholesterol. And today there's still a controversy in, a, you know, between these two groups as to which ligand, which is a real ligand for STAR-D5. So clearly, I'm when this came out that uh, bile acids were a capable, or I should say star B5 was capable of binding bile acids, that sparked my interest in maybe it could be playing a role in modulating FXR, the nuclear receptor signaling, because bile acids are ligands for FXR. But just cutting to the end, I'll just say right now I'm keeping my mind open that it might <laughs> as to what ligand uh, star D5 might bind, or it does bind. So again, thinking, uh, you know, kind of the rationale as to why I was also interested in studying this particular sterile transporter in disease states of, you know, diabetic kidney disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
is that the literature at the you know early at the time they showed that the major areas of expression were in the liver and as I said in the macrophages and I left off of here kidney. And I just looked up in the protein atlas where they look at protein and RNA expression level uh, across multiple tissues and as you can see that, that STAR-D5 is shown to have a very broad expression pattern. Not all of this matches up with the with RNA levels but we can see that the liver is really one of the highest uh, sites of expression for STAR-D5. And the data that I have looking at mouse kidney, looking at immunohistochemistry for where STAR-D5 was expressed, you can see in this up that the uh, is highly expressed in the tubules, in the proximal tubules specifically of the kidney, and there's lax expression in the glomeruli of the kidney. We also did immunohistochemistry staining in the rat small intestine, and we can see that we have a uh, staining of STAR-D5 in the small intestine. And there's been no reports really to, to date for STAR-D5's function in uh, the intestine. Um, but I would like to note, and what is of interest, that the, you see that we have localized expression of this protein really where the microvilli are. So this is a, a spot where within these two types of tissues, these polarized, polarized epithelial cells where you can have exchange and you would have uptake or efflux of uh, cholesterol at this point. So all this was uh, information was supporting that potentially star 5 was uh, functioning at the uh, plasma membrane or at the villi. So how does this relate to uh, FXR and LXR signaling? We'll start out with FXR signaling. And here we can see that there's a lot of data that have shown that activation of FXR, I will say this again just as a backup, that FXR is a nuclear receptor, so that means when a ligand binds to it, in this case bile acids binding to FXR, it'll then uh, work in the nucleus and activate gene transcription. And the target genes refer to those genes that FXR is increasing expression or decreasing expression and uh, indirectly. So FXR has been shown to work on uh, improving insulin resistance by decreasing gluconeogenesis by targeting uh, decreasing specific rate limiting enzymes in that pathway as well as decreasing lipogenesis similarly by decreasing uh, factors that uh, would promote uh, lipid synthesis one of them being fatty acid synthase but the hallmark or what FXR was uh, first uh, studied for, I would say, or known to do, was to regulate bile acid synthesis in the liver. And if we look at this again, this is through increasing a, a factor, short heterodimer partner, or SHIP, that then would act on the rate limit, when the rate limiting enzymes in the bile acid biosynthetic pathway, which is cytochrome P450, 7-alpha hydroxylase. So in the schema that is shown here, if we look at the hepatocyte, you have synthesis of bile acids from cholesterol. They are converted to bile salts, exported in the gallbladder where they can be dumped into the uh, intestine. Uh, and in the intestine, they work as a detergent. You know, they solubilize the lipids in the intestine to help for their digestion and absorption. But once they're in the, in the intestine, you can have uh, uh, bile acid binding proteins that help the transport of bile acids and their efflux out of the uh, enterocytes where they can be retaken back up by the hepatocytes through uh, transporters at the, at the membrane. So this is a set cycle. You have recycling of bile acids, we, you know, synthesis in the hepatocyte functioning in the intestine for lipid digestion and then recycling back to the hepatocyte. 
The problem is you want to maintain a, a homeostasis of bile acids in the hepatocyte. So as you have bile acids returning or their synthesis is increasing, you'll be shutting off their synthesis. And that is through binding the bile acids of, to FXR and decreasing CYP7A expression. In the intestine, FXR can also activate the increase the FGF 15 or 19, depending on that's mouse or human. And these FGFs work on a receptor in the hepatocyte, FGF4R, that will also help suppress bile acid synthesis. So the system is set up through FXR signaling that you modulate bile acids. As bile acid levels increase, you're going to shut off the synthesis and the reabsorption of them. So targeting FXR, there's so many possibilities. I mean, there seems, it seems to be working in multiple organs, it seems to be very protective against uh, liver fibrosis, NAFLD, hepatocellular carcinoma. In the kidney, it's uh, protective against diabetic nephro protective meaning if you have a synthetic ligand for FXR to increase its activity. Uh, against diabetic nephropathy. And you can see over here, even in the pancreas, it increases glucose-sensitive insulin secretion. So these are all the uh, improvements for insulin resistance that have been associated with FXR signaling. And we know that there's been many of these synthetic ligands that are based on the structure of the bile acid um, this is beta-cholic acid, which is known as INT747. These have been in use, uh, I guess, for in the treatment of primary biliary cholangitis. And they have been, I've just uh, found this, that there is from the uh, clinicaltrials.gov, yes, for looking specifically for what's in clinical trials for non allergic alcoholic fatty liver disease. There are two trials going on using this uh, obeticolic acid. Okay. And UofL, you may, I may be aware, was selected as a site for phase four clinical trials for using uh, obeticolic acid. But this is, I think, a derivative uh, or second generation up from this one that's used in these clinical trials for uh, clinical outcomes for TBC. So I just present all this uh, to give you the uh, background that FXR and its impact on metabolism, whether it's carbohydrate or lipid metabolism, has really has such a uh, broad ranging effect. So some of excitement there is to thinking if you have another modulator of that saline pathway, then that could impact on a lot of uh, processes. LXR signaling, again, we look at this where this plays a role. And again, ligand activated uh, increase in gene transcription. So this will be cholesterol oxysterols that uh, will activate LXR. And here again, when we look in the liver, Conversely, LXR will increase the CYP7A to increase the production of bile acids from cholesterol, and that's going to cholesterol. And in the intestine, the, you will have the increase of the uh, cholesterol efflux proteins, so you'll decrease absorption of cholesterol. And a lot of work has been done in the macrophages, where here, you know, again, you have the uh, increase in the cholesterol efflux protein, the ABC transporter A1, and that will help increase the efflux of cholesterol out of the macrophages. The goal bringing these back to the liver so you, we can eliminate cholesterol from our extrahepatic tissues. So I think what is uh, here, to see the sites where we see that we have FXR signaling playing a major metabolic role, as well as LXR signaling playing a me major metabolic role, are the sites where we see STAR-D5 is expressed. So what is the link 
potential link between these. So when I first looked at um, kidneys from di using a diabetic mouse model, I asked the question, you know, what is start what is a start 5 expression in this uh, mouse model? And if we what was known from previous work out of Moshe Levy's group at uh, University of Colorado is that in the kidney, you have FXR signaling again that will suppress uh, fatty acid synthesis. LXR signaling in the kidney will uh, maintain or increase, maintain cholesterol efflux from the kidney. And there is a regulator of cholesterol de novo synthesis, SREBB2, that can be uh, suppressed through LXR signaling. So this is kind of the normal homeostasis. But in diabetic kidney disease, what happens, high glucose will result in a decrease in the expression of FXR and LXR, which both directly and uh, indirectly can increase SREBB2 and SREBP1, which are transcription factors that will set up the system so you have an increase in cholesterol synthesis, increase in fatty acid synthesis, which will culminate in uh, triacylglycerol accumulation and cholesterol accumu accumulation within the, within the kidney. And these together will enhance endoplasm reticulum stress and enhance the inflammatory response within the kidney which ultimately leads to uh, diabetic kidney disease. And you have disruption of the brush border, so you have filtration is compromised also. So I asked the question, what role does STAR-D5 play in here? Is there any, uh, any protein expression in the kidney? Because over, this has been over 10 years ago, and no one had actually demonstrated that star 5 protein was expressed in the kidney. And we did uh, work that showed that it was, as I showed you with the IHC, that is expressed in the kidney, specifically in the proximal tubules, and that in the diabetic, uh, in the kidneys from the diabetic mouse model, that STAR-D5 expression was increased. And we measured cholesterol levels and showed that uh, cholesterol levels were increased in the, kidney, in the kidneys of this mouse model. So then we just posed the question that, uh, at this time, thinking star 5 is a cholesterol binding protein. Does it uh, contribute uh, to uh, cholesterol efflux? In that, in the diabetic kidney disease, if you have an increase in star 5 expression, if it binds cholesterol, then that will sequester cholesterol and decrease its uh, efflux from the kidney. And that way can propose proposing that it can contribute to the cholesterol accumulation. So we tested this, and we did uh, cholesterol efflux assays using a cell line, uh, HKC8 cell line, which is a proximal tubule uh, cell line, a human proximal tubule cell line. Although with full disclosure now, they're genotyping these cells, and it's probably a fibroblast. Um, but nevertheless, looking at this, we measured uh, cholesterol efflux from these cells. And to do this, we labeled the cells with tritiated cholesterol, so incorporated within the cell. We added an acceptor protein, APOA1, and looked at the uh, percent of efflux into the media over the total cholesterol that was in the cell. And we did this in cells where we had knocked down star 5 expression. And I will show you that knockdown in the next slide. And we found that when we had a loss of star 5 in these proximal tubule cells, that the cholesterol efflux was enhanced. So this would suggest that potentially star 5 was, you know, sequestering cholesterol, not allowing it to uh, move from the cell. And once we got rid of that suppressor, then you're more cholesterol was moving out of the cell in an ABCA1 uh, dependent manner through the uh, acceptor molecule APOA1. 
So fast forward about eight years, and so when the idea came out that Star D5 might be binding to, uh, but not might be binding, it was shown that Star D5 was binding to bile acids, we asked the question, well, maybe there's another role, what would be the role of binding the bile acids? So we asked the question, if we knock down Star D5 in the same cell line, as shown here, using SI or, uh, RNA, do we have an effect on FXR activity? And to measure this, what you can do is use a reporter gene activity assay. So this is a luciferase assay where basically you have FXR that will bind to this element and you'll have some activity that we can see is in a ligand dependent manner when we add the uh, bile acid chenodeoxycholic acid at 25, um, that should be micromolar, that you see an increase in this reported gene activity. That means FXR is binding here and increasing activity. And so we use non-transfected cells that control SHRNA, and we see a four to six-fold increase in reported gene activity over the non-ligand stated. But when we knocked down STAR D5, we saw a further increase in activity. So this is suggesting that uh, in the absence of STAR D5, that you have an increase in FXR-related activity. So all based on that, we thought, we proposed that there might be a link between STAR D5 expression and FXR signaling. So if, uh, does it modulate FXR activity, basically, by limiting or facilitating access to the ligand. So here we can see there's, if we put this up as star D5 and FXR both bind this ligand CDCA, if we showed that if we decrease star D5, we have an increase in FXR activation. So we might expect this to decrease the targets of FXR, which are SREBP1, and would decrease fatty acid synthesis. And there's some evidence there could be also uh, FXR in a cell type or tissue type dependent manner can increase the cholesterol efflux protein. So that could also explain potentially the increase in cholesterol efflux in the absence of STAR-D5. But to look at this uh, completely, Instead of using the in vitro types of approach, we would uh, generate a star D5 knockout mouse line because none had been, at this point, none had been reported in the lit, uh, literature. And to look at, uh, this way to look at global signaling and target gene expression. So to do this, we use the CRISPR-Cas9 editing and uh, Shown here is just the exon intron structure of the STAR D5 gene. We uh, designed two guide RNAs that are shown here. There are certain sequences that you have to target when you use this uh, approach to uh, introducing mutations. And so we found that in this case, we had an exon 1, we insert an adenosine at the uh, base pair 60, so we call this mouse line exon 160 insert A, and an exon 3 generated a two base pair deletion, so this mouse line that we followed up with was exon 3 two base pair uh, deletion. And to validate any of these, we uh, uh, for the STAR-D5 uh, knockout mice, we did Western blot analysis, and this is of from liver whole cell lysates. And we have both male and female here showing that we have expression in the wild type, lower expression in a heterozygous animal. And we do not detect star 5 in the knockouts uh, from these uh, animals. So we have a, a validated star 5 knockdown, whole body knockdown animal that we can begin to uh, do our studies. And the first thing is to characterize uh, this animal model. 
Now, you would think if this, uh, well, I'll save that comment for later. So characterizing this uh, animal model, we look at the body weight, there's no difference. And the liver to body weight, there's no difference based on the, the knockout, which is fine. And then we looked, used, oh. How old were these mice at this point? Okay, at this point the mice were five months old. Oh. Okay. And then when we, uh, I, so from the liver we isolated the RNA and did RT-PCR analysis, quantitative RT-PCR analysis, to look at target genes for LXR and FXR in the liver. So if we look at LXR itself or FXR itself, we see there's no difference between the genotypes at the knockout. If we look at ABCA1, which is a cholesterol transporter and an LXR uh, target gene, there's no significant difference between the wild type and the knockout. SREBF1, which is like one of the master controllers of lipogenesis, you see there's no difference between the control and knockout. CYP7A1, which is a rate limiting enzyme in bile acid biosynthesis, there's no significant difference between the two genotypes. HMG CoA reductase, which is uh, or in cholesterol biosynthetic pathway, as well as SREBF2, which is a uh, regulator of cholesterol synthesis itself. These are trending towards an increase in the uh, mouse liver of the STARDI5 knockout mice, but you can't conclude there's any difference. I mean, so we, uh, so basically in, what I have here in control diet, if we just look at the knockout mouse and, and those animals, comparing it to the wild type animals, they're litter mate controls that we have not observed a difference in body or liver weight or some of these target gene expression. And I will doubt that we're using only male uh, mice in these experiments because uh, there are some differences in the literature reported for sex-dependent differences in FXR signaling. So we didn't want to uh, make it com confounding. So I wasn't too surprised because I didn't expect to see an overt phenotype with just knocking out star D5. We look at this in the context of disease states, whether it's diabetes, impacting diabetic nephropathy or uh, insulin resistance on uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the experiment really was to look at the difference after these mice have been on a high fat diet for 13 weeks. And in this case, they should be having developed uh, some fatty liver, steatosis, and on the uh, some non-alcoholic fatty liver disease phenotypes. So when we put the mice on a high-fat diet, again, these are all uh, male mice, we saw that, uh, as expected, you have an increase in body weight after 13 weeks on a high-fat diet in the wild-type mice. Um, there was I think due to low number, but anyways, we didn't see a significant weight gain in the knockout mice at this point. And if you look at the liver to body weight, to give an indication of that, we see here that there's no significant difference in the liver to body weight between the wild type and the knockout mice on control or high fat diet. But again, I point out they have a trend towards decrease and uh, for the uh, knockout animals, if you compare these, these are the only thing that is coming close to potential difference. But at this point, we can't conclude anything based on the liver to body weight, but just something to look at. So looking at the target gene expression, this is, um, again, uh, I had gone through the data looking for the wild type and knockout animals on the control diet. So now I'm just layering in the effect when we look at the high fat diet. 
And as we'd seen before for LXR, ABCA1, SREB, F1, uh, there's really no, there's no effect on by diet or genotype. So this is not impacting those factors. FXR, uh, there's no effect really on FXR or the CYP7A1, which is a rate limiting step in bile acid biosynthesis, and HMG-CoA reductase or SREBF2. There's no significant difference uh, in the with the high fat diet induced changes in expression of these target genes between the wild type or the uh, star D5 knockout mouse models. So again, it's tempting to look at there's greater changes between the control diet and knockout diet with the with the uh, knockout diet, the control and the high fat diet and the knockout animals that you may see here with HMG-CoA reductase and SREBF2. And I think it's, an, it's uh, suggestive that I think we need more animal numbers because of the high variability that we're seeing to see if there's really true impact of the knockout of STAR-D5. And this would be on cholesterol metabolism mainly is where we're seeing this. So the, so I will say, and to finish this up, is that while we were generating the star 5 knockout animals, which took about a year to get to the point where we could actually start doing experiments, the uh, group that has been working on star 5 in the in the liver came out with their report on a Star-D5 knockout mouse model. So I'm going to say this is, I'm telling you this as a second story, but it is the first story since they are the first to publish this. But the, they are, in this figure, what they show, there's a H&E stain of a liver section from the wild type and the star D5 knockout mice. And what it's showing here is that there's an increase in lipid. You see these white vacuoles here that suggest that. And when they directly measure cholesterol and triacylglyceride levels, they do see a significant increase in cholesterol and triacylglycerides in the star D5 knockout animals. And I will just point out here that when they look by RT-PCR analysis, they see a small but significant decrease in the HMG-CoA reductase and an increase in the ABCA1 transporter. So off the bat, the data that uh, is being reported with this study is I'm not getting consistent results as what they are reporting. And when they looked at this, what this group, I will say, is very much interested and has done a lot of in vitro work to look at trafficking of cholesterol within the cell by STAR-D5. And what they show in this set of experiments is they're measuring actually the levels of cholesterol in the plasma membrane. And they can do this by two methods. They can either isolate the membrane and measure cholesterol levels directly, or they can do a fluorescent tag where they can actually use an extracellular tag that will bind to cholesterol that is free in the plasma membrane and you will get an increased fluorescence. So when I do tag the free accessible cholesterol in the plasma membrane, this is in macrophages that they've isolated from wild type or star D5 knockout uh, animals. And they see in the absence of star D5, there's less cholesterol that is at the plasma membrane and is accessible. And that is, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a significant change in the total cholesterol levels in the macrophages. Although free cholesterol levels, <coughs> well, and or no change in the free cholesterol levels, although the cholesterol ester levels seem to be indicating. So what this suggests is that 
the total cholesterol pool is not necessarily changing, but the distribution of the cholesterol within that cell is changing. And the major impact of the loss of STAR-D5 in the macrophage is that there's a decrease in the plasma membrane cholesterol pool. And what that may impact then is the ability or the amount of cholesterol that can be effluxed from the macrophages. So that's what they're showing here if they look at the uh, cholesterol that uh, moves out of the macrophages you know, with the uh, wild type or the STAR-D5 deficient cells. In this case, they add the cyclic AMP, which is a, a, a treatment that is commonly used for macrophage to promote efflux to a lipid protein such as ApoAB1. They see that there is a loss of um, loss of cholesterol efflux in the Stardy 5 knockout uh, mouse models. And that if they don't add cyclic AMP, they don't see any difference uh, between these. Now, if they overexpress star 5 in the uh, knockout line, they can see they regain a burst in cholesterol efflux from these cells. So from this all together, what they are uh, suggesting is, or their data are supporting, is that in the absence of star 5 you have less movement of cholesterol to the plasma membrane, and the consequence of that is that there's less cholesterol being effluxed. Now, these are in macrophages, and cholesterol efflux from macrophages is an important uh, process for taking cholesterol, getting cholesterol back to the liver for clearance. And if you have an accumulation of cholesterol in macrophages, that can lead to foam cell development in one of the first uh, and which is a contributor to uh, atherosclerosis. So cholesterol handling by the macrophages is an important uh, process. So in summary, I uh, looked at uh, liver, uh, macrophage, and a proximal tubule cell line. We're really putting this in the, from the thinking of FXR and LXR signaling with their different ligands. What you would expect in the liver is to have a decrease it, through FXR-mediated mechanisms, a decrease in lipogenesis and bile acid uh, biosynthesis, whereas through LXR-mediated mechanisms, you would expect to have a decrease in cholesterol synthesis and an increase in bile acid synthesis and lipogenesis. And what was observed in the other in the uh, Star D5 knockout mouse model from the um, from the report is that there was a decrease in HMG CoA reductase, increase in ABCA1, and they saw an overall increase in cholesterol and triacylglycerol accumulation. And this is due to the uh, well, they never. I'll just stop there. So they have a decrease in cholesterol synthesis. Cholesterol is being accumulated within the liver, so this would be, lead to a fatty liver uh, phenotype, which they saw by their H&E staining. In our uh, STAR-D5 knockout mouse models, we don't really see any difference in the gene expression for these uh, key regulators. And perhaps though, we are seeing an increase in the uh, Great limb enzyme and cholesterol biosynthesis. Looking at macrophages, again, you'd expect to see an increase in ABCA1, the uh, efflux uh, transporter, cholesterol transporter, with both FXR and LXR signaling. And um, what was shown in the absence of STAR-D5 is that there's a decrease in cholesterol efflux, which you know, we're using the proximal tubule cell lines and knocking down, I saw an increase in cholesterol efflux. So trying to, uh, and at this point, I mean, I'm trying to take all this information in and think about the uh, interpretation of the data. It's clearly by the uh, Gill group looking at the macrophages that the STAR-D5 
summarize that it transport cholesterol to the plasma membrane. And that uh, in the absence of STAR-D5, you have about a 20% decrease in the plasma membrane pool and less cholesterol efflux. So this is supporting that potential role for STAR-D5 and moving cholesterol to the plasma membrane in macrophages. So the question is, is this a macrophage-specific function? These cell types are very are set up to have very specific functions for uh, lipid handling and cholesterol handling. So I think we need to look at this uh, more closely in a cell-specific uh, manner. So what is uh, some of the future directions? I mean, so, I mean, from this preliminary data that I have, we're not seeing significant changes in some of these target genes that I mean, you had predicted by the loss of STAR-D5. But again, I think we have to uh, think about adding a stressor to the system. We did a high-fat diet. By implication, we expect ER stress to be induced. I haven't measured that yet. But if we add a, a stressor that we know induces ER stress, that will increase STAR-D5 and ask the question in the absence of, and the, under those conditions, what would we expect to happen? And would we see any changes in FXR or LXR signaling under those conditions? Or we can conclude that STAR-D5 doesn't modulate FXR or LXR activity. And so what would be an alternative hypothesis or something we can look at? This is something Dr. Kling and I have thought about and developed a model for, and this is measuring potential inflammatory responses in the develop of non-alcoholic -alco steatohepatitis. And in this case, we still have we're looking at this, if we, in the loss of STAR-D5, we saw a loss of plasma membrane, uh, accessible cholesterol in the plasma membrane. So let's look at this from the cases where you have overexpression of STAR-D5 and you have an increased plasma membrane cholesterol, which you might be having an increase, which you'd expect to be efflux uh, out of the cell. But if you have stressors, such as reactive oxygen species, ER stress inducers, that can then suppress cholesterol efflux that will increase uh, free cholesterol within the cell. I'm showing here within the hepatocyte. The same can be uh, true for uh, macrophages. In this case, if we're thinking of the CUFA cells, the macro resident hepatocyte, you know, liver macrophages, if you have elevated plasma membrane cholesterol, this could signal or activate TLR signaling, which will increase the inflammatory responses in these macrophages. And so it could be that you have STAR-D5 role in the macrophages and layers over its role in the hepatocyte in terms of liver disease, such as NASH, so that it can promote further inflammation by increased recruitment and increase uh, production of inflammatory cytokines from the macrophages that are resident in the liver. So that is uh, a great model. A lot of work to see if it uh, will be tested. So we want to uh, look at ER stressors to see the impact of uh, lipid metabolism inflammatory responses and uh, the impact on liver disease. And so I have to thank the people involved for a lot of the, the early kidney work and looking at STAR-D5 in the kidney was postdoc in the lab, Yu Chu Chen. Currently, uh, Kellyanne Peel, a research uh, research technician and Dr. Kling's lab has doing a lot of work helping uh, characterize the STAR-D5 knockout mouse models. Well, early work looking at the diabetic uh, kidney disease, I uh, did a sabbatical in Eleanor Letter's lab and the Jalal Kundamiri, who's now an associate professor at Howard University. We worked together on that project. 
I need to recognize Dr. Klang and Dr. Chang in biochemistry and molecular genetics. Here have been uh, Dr. Kling, a 25-year collaborator, and I'm not going to be, uh, Alan, I'm not going to be around another 25 years, but he's been very instrumental in helping in the ER stress response and um, thinking of uh, that aspect of the project. And I'm indebted to uh, Ron Gregg, the Chair of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics, who has supported and not only financially, but with his sweat equity and developing the uh, Stardy 5 uh, knockout uh, mouse lines, and to Tim Hoffman, who works in the lab, who actually did uh, the work for knocking out the lines. I will say Ron is actually doing the maintenance of all the colonies, so that is a very much appreciated the work put into that. And Thanks to you for coming and listening, and uh, comments are welcome, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't understand that the uh, other group there uh, published that they thought they saw an increase in ABCA1. I mean, that sounds starting. I think your data are, you know, supportive of that direction. If only the, there were higher mouse numbers to reduce that variability so it would become statistically. But at the same time, did they show uh, a decrease cholesterol efflux? So how does that work? I thought ABCA1 is a cholesterol efflux protein or is it a cholesterol uptake protein? It's a, oh, ABCA1 is a cholesterol efflux protein? Okay, there we go. I think you were uh, here in the macrophages. So the uh, yes, yeah, so the decrease. <clears throat> so total cholesterol is this what you're asking? Total cholesterol is not really changing. Uh, free cholesterol is not. I mean, it's potentially going down, but because that's because the cholesterol esters are going up. So the total cholesterol is not changing. It's moving from free cholesterol to cholesterol ester form. And so that would promote accumulation of cholesterol within the macrophage. And that is due in part because there's less being efflux in these uh, knockout cells. Barbara, and it, oh. Can you hear me? Uh, Hi, yes. Barbara. Nice, nice to hear. Thank you. So, in this experiment, are you have you looked at males versus females or ovex versus females? Because there's such a striking cholesterol lipid accumulation in the liver in aromatase deficiency, and I wondered where where, where that might fit in. You're cutting out a little bit there, Steve, but. Uh, and thank you. the in this particular experiment, they didn't say uh, the sex of the animals they're using. There's four of them that they've only used, so they didn't they didn't parse out any sex differences. Yeah. Well, as I said, I'd be curious about females versus ovex females. Okay. So I'll put that on the list. Uh huh. <laughs> So we use um, cholesterol is actually approved for use in diabetes. They also reduce cholesterol. They bind, you know, and the mechanisms I would say more is by binding bile acid gut. Right. So the idea of bile acid resins and how that would impact this signaling pathway. Um, yeah, so I think when we start talking about the intestine, because their FXR signaling, it becomes, I think, complex because when the bile acid pool starts changing, then FXR type signaling kind of starts changing. So, uh, but certainly in the liver, going back to the liver, yes, the cholesterol would be, the CYP7A should be going up and getting more, you know, bile acids to decrease the cholesterol there. So the mechanism that's proposed as to how much of an increase when you use this is through the FXR signal. Okay. Changes when you give the 
So they initially of course they would introduce this cholesterol over the years, but they also have it's not very really low cost, but they're good enough to actually be approved as yeah, well, that's and yeah. So I mean, I think it's only been in the last five to eight years that these FXR have been recognized for Correct. diabetes. So it's a well, of course, the clinical effect was known before. They didn't know how that happened. But okay. <laughs> okay. So they had observed that. That's interesting. Back in the was worked out later. Well, you look at everything where that FXR touches, I would say, and you would think that these drugs would be the panacea, you know, the magic bullet type of thing to help improve. Uh, but again, I think because of the, the cell-specific actions, there is, uh, and there's always off-target effects. So it's not, I don't, I mean, in the clinic, I don't know if you, are using any of the FXR agonists, or I guess those are still in the trials. That, yeah. Well, one, yeah, one of the early ones they had to withdraw because it was worsening insulin resistance. And I think that's because the FGF pathway was not as activated in that case. So. Because when you know, in your last diagram, when you had much of the fatty liver that we had used to see, I mean, start with the, you know, the high triglyceride in the thyroid, and that's the hypothesis of how they have their genome impact. Then you have everything else coming through. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you for your attention and uh, 